What would happen if we went to Mars today? Well, that'd be a little bit of a surprise because we should have left Earth six months ago, and that's if you're using nuclear thermal propulsion capabilities, which do not yet exist today. Using chemical propulsion like we have in uh, rockets today, the trip to Mars would probably be on the order of eight or nine months. During that eight or nine month time, we would be weightless for the, the most of the transit time, and our bodies would be accommodating and adjusting to the weightless environment. There's a possibility we'd be using artificial gravity uh, on the trip, and if we did that, we might be rotating our spacecraft, or at least a large part of the spacecraft, so we would have spent the last six or eight or nine months actually rotating head over heels in an artificial gravity centrifuge several times each minute. Either way, our bodies will have adjusted to that environment, and when we land on Mars, we'll have to accommodate to the new stationary one-third of a G environment of the surface of Mars. We're going to be on Mars for 18 months, according to our design reference mission. NASA has put together a, a standardized uh, mission plan for going to Mars, not an official plan, but a, a straw man plan that allows all the different organizations, all the different engineers and scientists working on trips to Mars to work toward the same mission design. So we know how many months in transit, how many months on the planet, how many months coming back. Those 18 months on Mars will be the busiest time of our happy little crew of, of our lives. We'll be working as productively as we possibly can on the surface of Mars to justify the expense of the mission, and it will be a large expense spread across several space agencies around the world so that we are able to produce results that will allow future missions to fly. Results that are so interesting and so, so uh, uh, valuable that future missions will be, will be funded and sent to do subsequent missions to Mars. And then after the, six, after the uh, 18 months on the planet, there'll be a six month transit coming back to Earth. So what would happen if we landed on Mars today? We would see outside of our window a view very much like this, a, a red landscape with a substantial amount of relief to it and a lot of uh, prospects for, for exploration as we understand the planet. What we would not see is something that looks like this. This is a scene that astronauts see now after six months in transit in a spacecraft after they land on a planetary surface. The spacecraft is the International Space Station, and the planetary surface, of course, is the Earth. You can notice immediately the differences in color. Earth has uh, got a lot more green to it than Mars does. Here, even in the steppes of Kazakhstan, this was just a, a few months ago in, uh, in June, when this uh, particular astronaut crew was able to, to land successfully after the space station mission. We have recovery vehicles on the horizon, uh, poised to bring a lot of rescue personnel to the landing site to help the astronauts make the transition from their spacecraft just off screen left, uh, right here into a medical facility, a, an inflatable tent off the screen to the left. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a lot of people here that you would not see on Mars. What you would see on Mars is not just a single astronaut, but probably five or six astronauts, this group of people right in the middle, each of them requiring the support of others, uh, just as that single astronaut does in this scene. And, and imagine the number of people for three astronauts in this landing. Uh, there's lots of people required for a typical landing on the, uh, on the Earth. One of the issues that this astronaut is confronting d in this picture is a uh, balance disturbance. He's, his uh, organs of balance and his inner ear have become accustomed to the weightlessness of spaceflight, and he's not as confident standing up and moving around uh, as he was before flight. Uh, in that medical tent, after a brief checkup, we'll be asking him and his colleagues to do a very simple uh, stereotyped uh, kind of uh, set of uh, measurements that mimic the activities an astronaut might well be doing uh, immediately after arriving on the surface of Mars. Things as simple as unassisted, standing up from a seated position in a chair, standing up from, uh, from flat on the floor as if they had accidentally stumbled and fallen on, on Mars. Uh, moving weights around, moving uh, large objects around a short distance, and even the, the heel-to-toe walk that is a very good indicator of integrated sensory motor function. Those, uh, those uh, uh, studies that are done right now on spacecraft uh, and on Soyuz crews that land back on the Earth are providing information to future spacecraft designers, both for Mars landers and for Mars habitats, so they will know how to design their vehicles to provide the best of support and care for astronauts in this awkward phase of transition from weightlessness to Mars surface gravity. Uh, this particular image illustrates visual testing because we have uh, recently, over the last several years, identified changes in visual acuity as a problem astronauts have in long duration spaceflight. It comes on very gradually, very slowly. It was probably there even on shorter flights back in the shuttle era. And the extended time on the space station simply allows it to become more fully expressed. 
Uh, the, it may be related to a change in the cardiovascular system I mentioned earlier. Uh, the cardiovascular system is, of course, full of the body's fluids, especially the blood. Uh, the, the blood does shift in the upper and the body from the lower body into the upper body. Actually, what it does is equilibrate in the absence of gravity so that it is more evenly distributed up and down the body's long axis. But that has the net result of being an increase in, in body fluid in the upper part of the body. The upper part of the body is where the head is in the brain, and there's increased filling of the head and the brain and perhaps an increased pressure in the upper part of the body. That pressure has to go somewhere, and it, it tries to find places to go, including along the optic nerve tracts. Uh, those are the tracts the, of the optic nerves from the brain to the eye. And if it does that, then perhaps it's pushing against the eyeball and flattening the eyeball somewhat, uh, changing the focal length of the eye and causing the astronauts to have visual disturbances, such as uh, 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 decreasing uh, near vision capability. It's more or less like they've lost uh, a lot of their near visual, uh, near field uh, visual accommodation ab ability, and they're, they're more farsighted than they were before. Uh, this is uh, only a little bit of a nuisance on the space station, except when you're trying to do some close-up work, like reading your checklist, like, say, for a Soyuz landing. But we don't know if it's going to continue to get worse on longer missions beyond low Earth orbit, and especially longer missions and weightlessness. So we're studying the phenomenon today on the space station, and we're also evaluating some of the mechanisms behind it. It may be that this fluid shift is actually the cause of this, and if that's the case, then it makes sense that reversing the fluid shift might alleviate the symptoms and, and cause the eye to re assume, resume its more normal spherical shape. So we're using a Russian device uh, to uh, redistribute the body's fluids as if the individual is standing up under Earth's normal gravity. The Russian device is called Chibis. It's a lower body negative pressure device, and it's just what it sounds like. It applies a slight negative pressure to the lower body, allowing the fluids to redistribute in a normal uh, manner uh, typical for life on Earth uh, under a gravity field. If measurements like this one and others indicate uh, a return to normal visual function and other measurements indicate a, a change in the fluid distribution, that might be a hint as to the right path to proceed for changes, uh, uh, for the visual acuity changes that occur in long duration spaceflight. <clears throat> Another issue of long duration spaceflight may well be bouts of loneliness and isolation. Uh, the six astronauts, if there are six on the Mars mission, will be the only people on that mission. And when they land on Mars, they're going to be the only people on the entire planet of Mars. Uh, they, will be, uh, they will be isolated as no humans have ever been isolated before, and they will also be as autonomous, as reliant on themselves as anybody has ever been. Yes, they will have infrastructure provided by the, by the, uh, the national space agencies that funded their travel there. There will be uh, vehicles waiting for them on Mars with uh, habitats and, and life support systems. And, and there will be everybody in mission control and multiple mission controls around the world, plus all of us back on Earth rooting for them. But when it comes to the final analysis, uh, we're all tens of minutes away by radio uh, because of the distance between the Earth and Mars. And so the astronauts will really be working by themselves uh, on their own, uh, supporting each other in this very uh, uh, stressful, highly autonomous setting. They will be trained to work with each other to understand the problems, the psychological problems of, of isolation and confinement and long distance space flight. And I, I'm sure they'll be well selected and very well prepared to do this, but there will be support from, from uh, back on Earth to make sure that uh, they are able to overcome whatever challenges are presented to them when, when time permits. <clears throat> I've mentioned a few of the problems that have occurred in long duration space flight, the problems that we're studying on, on the one year ISS mission. We also have the effect of isolation and increased radiation and low Earth orbit on the immune system. We have changes in the, in the flora and uh, the bacteria that, that inhabit our gut, so that uh, allows us to metabolize nutrients uh, in a healthy manner. We have the loss of muscles and bone capacity and long duration weightlessness. We think we have a good solution to that that involves exercise, especially resistive exercise, zero gravity weightlifting. Uh, but the problem now seems to be, or the problem now is, one of repackaging the systems that, are, that seem to be working well on the space station for use in a much more compact uh, form on the, on the Mars vehicle. And we also have the issue of, of uh, human factors aspects of the space flight, such as uh, diminished fine motor skills. That is, how does one manipulate delicate instruments and controls and switches and things like that uh, if the, the sensory motor system and the, the body have adapted to the altered gravity environment of Mars and the altered gravity environment of, of space flight. 
So we're one half of the way through our one year expedition uh, above Earth in the uh, ISS. And this is a chance for us to, to test, our, uh, test ourselves. Have we done our homework well? Have we learned the lessons from previous missions on the International Space Station, from previous uh, missions on the Russian Space Station Mir, and from a string of, of successful Salyut missions the Russians flew? Have we learned our lessons from the American Skylab Space Station back in the 1970s, and from all other human space flights? Uh, the, the, the chance uh, to test ourselves by doing a one-year mission is the chance to see whether the lessons we've learned so far and the, and the predictions we've made based on missions up until now are met by the, by the results from upcoming uh, uh, days and months in the one-year ISS mission. Astronaut Scott Kelly and his Russian one-year mission counterpart, Mikhail Kornienko, and uh, their crewmates on the International Space Station right now and other astronauts, past and future, and in fact, all of us that are working uh, on their programs uh, here on the Earth are, uh, are trying to solve the problems of long duration space flight. Uh, and the uh, one year mission is a chance for us to do exactly that. If we are successful in solving these problems of long duration space flight, future missions will be able to proceed with confidence and, and uh, secure in the knowledge that they know what to expect, at least based on our experience on the space station so far. And of course, they'll be in a better position to respond to new challenges that we have not yet been able to, to predict and respond to those successfully so that their missions are successful and uh, effective and uh, uh, productive. Our goal is to provide uh, the astronauts that land on Mars to make them as, as safe and uh, 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 healthy and as productive and efficient and as happy as possible. That is the work that we're doing on the International Space Station today. For more information, please go to this uh, website. Thank you.